All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone who's joining us online and everyone who's here. Let's say hi to those who are watching online. Shabbat Shalom. Today's portion, we're reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 35, verse 1. And before we do, let us recite the blessing before reading the Torah. Marhu et Adonai mevorach. Baruch Adonai mevorach leolam vayed. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher bekar banu mikol ha'amin. Venetan lanu etorato. Baruch Atah Adonai noten haTorah. Bless Adonai who is blessed. Blessed is Adonai who is blessed forever and ever. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who selected us from all the nations and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. Today's portion can be found in the book of Exodus 35, and I'm going to read in Hebrew verses 1 through 3. And it says in the Hebrew, Vayakel Moshe et Koladat Israel. Koladat Bene Israel. Vayomer Alechem Ele Hadevarim Asher Tsiva Adonai la Sot Otam. Sheshet Yamim Te Ase Melecha Uvayom. Chavie Yihie. Uh, excuse me, hash vi yi hi ye lachem, kodesh shabbat shabbaton la adonai, kol ha ose vo melecha yumat. Lo teva aru esh bechol mush vetechem beyom ha shabbat. Today we're going to read a little, quite a bit less in the English than we typically would. Moshe assembled the whole community of the people of Israel and said to them, These are the things which Adonai has ordered you to do. In six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is to be a holy day for you a Shabbat of complete rest in honor of Adonai. Whoever does any work on it is to be put to death. You are not to kindle a fire in any of your homes on Shabbat. Now the closing blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher netan lanu Torah emet Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe. You have given us the Torah of truth and planted within us everlasting life. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Today's portion, Vayakel, we have a double portion today, Vayakel Pekude, Exodus 35, 1 through 40, 38. Uh, we're going to do things a, a little different today um, in how much I teach or the, uh, the direction of which I'm teaching today. Last week's portion, Parashat Kitisa, we spent a lot of time talking about the oil and the uh, 
the drops of the oil, how the oil was collected, uh, what oil was suitable for use in the menorah in the temple. Today's portion, Vayachel, I want to give you the uh, Vayachel and uh, Pekude. Anybody know why? I know you guys know why, but just as a reminder why we have a double portion sometimes and some years we don't is because some years there's an extra month of a dar, dar bet. And so because of that, we're able to split, have a portion each week. This year, we're back to having double portions at times. This is one of those weeks. Uh, portion uh, via Kel means and he gathered. And again, it starts in Exodus 35.1. And portion uh, Pekude starts in Exodus 38.21. So to give you just a little overview of these portions, before we discuss the uh, particular aspect we want to talk about today, uh, Moshe assembled the people of Israel. He reiterates the command for them to serve God, to serve God how? By celebrating and keeping Shabbat holy, separate, different. You can characterize it a lot of different ways. It was a totally different day than the other six. It was holy. It was separate. It was consecrated. It's the only day that has a name that God gave, Shabbat. He then tells where uh, he conveys uh, Hashem's instructions regarding the making of the Mishkan, the tabernacle. Um, the people donate everything, the 13 things that needed to be uh, assembled or gathered in order to uh, do the work of building the Mishkan. And the people give so much that he has to tell them, stop, we got enough. That's one thing you never hear in modern uh, religious gatherings of any kind. Stop, quit bringing stuff, quit giving, we got enough. Seems like there's never enough. For, and there should always be the idea of doing something with what comes in, with doing the mitzvot and doing the uh, gimelu chasidim, a lot of things that can be done with whatever continues to come in. At the time, why did Moses tell them to stop? Because they had all, of the, all that they needed for the purpose that was... Um, in the time when they were building the tabernacle, that was the main focus, getting that done. Uh, from there, things continued. Um, but a team of artisans began to make the Mishkan, its furnishings, uh, led by Betzazel. Uh, you can read that in a portion, uh, Parashat Terumah, Tetzaveh, and Kitisa, which we had uh, last week. Um, we talked about the, the three layers of the roof coverings, the uh, 48 gold-plated wall panels, 100 silver sockets, the parachet, the veil that separated the, between the sanctuary and the two chambers, the screen that in front of it, the ark, and it's covered with the keravim, the angels or the, the beings, the keravim, and the table and its showbread, seven branch menorah with its special specially prepared oil that we talked about a lot last week, the golden altar, the incense burned on it, the anointing oil, um, all the way down to the um, copper mirrors. A record is kept of the gold and silver and copper donated by the people. Um, uh, Betzalel and uh, Aholiav and, the, and their assistants made the eight garments the apron, the breastplate, the cloak, the crown, the hat, tunic, sash, breeches, according to the specifications communicated to Moshe um, in Parashat Tetzaveh. Uh, the Mishkan is completed. All of its components are brought to Moshe. It's erected. Um, he anoints it with the holy anointing oil and initiates or um, installs Aaron as the high priest and his four sons into the priesthood, a cloud appears over the Mishkan, signifying the divine presence. That in effect, Hashem was saying, I'm pleased with what you've done. You have carried out what I've asked you to do. And my presence can come and abide with you. So those are the two portions. But what I want to get to when I 
each year I've been trying to talk about a different aspect of the portion. Um, and this year I didn't get very far before I knew where I wanted to go. Um, so let me read this to you again. Exodus 35, 1, Moshe assembled the whole community of the people of Israel and said to them, these are the things which Adonai has ordered you to do. On six days, work is to be done. But the seventh day is to be holy, to be a holy day for you, a Shabbat of complete rest in order, in honor of Adonai. Whoever does any work on it will be put to death. You are not to kindle any fire in your homes on Shabbat. Pause right here before I get started. We've had a lot of talk about this idea, this connection between the Brit Hadishah and the, and the Tanakh. And so I've been wanting to, whenever I can, bring um, uh, understanding of why Rav Shaul said certain things and did certain things based on t the Tanakh, right? And I, I was reminded of something. When Rabbi Shapiro was with us, for the benefit of those, some of you are watching or some of you here who don't know who he is or how he came to know Messiah, he grew up in an Orthodox home. He's an Iraqi Jew. Uh, the son of rabbi, grandson, and so on and so forth. And he found Messiah in the Talmud in various places. And it, it was like the, the klipot, the blinders were removed. He recognized that's Messiah. How can we say it's not? That's how he found Messiah. When he was here, he made a comment that I hadn't heard him make. And he said the first time that he read the book of Matidyahu Matthew, you guys remember the first thing he said about it? He said, this is Jewish. And so when he said that, I was sitting there and I said, wow, you know, I wish I could just pause him right there and say, Tell, explain why. Because um, unless you know Judaism, you won't recognize it's, Judea it's Jewish, right? You can say that about anything. You know, we talk about tacos a lot here. I don't know why it always comes up. But, you know, if you know what a taco tastes like, then you recognize it's a taco, right? Even blindfolded. Even if someone doesn't give you a name for it, you still recognize for what it is. You say, this is Jewish. Loaded with midrash and um, an argument, um, ideas that are Talmudic. Even though the Talmud um, continued to be written for hundreds of years, the understanding of Judaism was there from way back, and they just got to write it down at one point, but the understanding was there. How many of you know that something can be understood? We understand a lot of things that aren't written down. Talmud was one of those passed down, understood in Judaism, and for different reasons it was written down, uh, which I don't have time to get into. But the idea is that everything we see in Scripture is Jewish. Contrary to what a lot of our Christian friends believe because they don't they have no idea they don't understand judaism we talked about this idea in path of the just that what was hashem saying what did they equate wisdom to study of torah and how should we study torah by like we're on a treasure hunt that's the kind of the picture that he gave of studying torah but it's interesting here, we talked about last week something um, that at the time when I brought it up, I just didn't, I wasn't looking forward enough to see the connection of this week. But last week we talked about the 39 melachot, the 39 prohibitions of work on Shabbat. And from a Christian perspective would look like, oh my gosh, you know, and there's typically no real understanding that's taught specifically what are these, what, does, what constitutes work on Shabbat and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. This is where we have to constantly look to Israel. We look back to the covenant and, the, and, and the, um, the covenants, but also the understanding that Israel had. And from a messianic standpoint, then when Messiah, when Yeshua came around, he didn't change it. He operated in it. And so many things we see him do were based on not just um, on uh, the written Tanakh, but also on uh, the oral law and, 
and continued. He, they weren't separate. The one wasn't above the other. The oral law was how we go about doing, keeping Torah. How do we know how to keep it? So one, as soon as I read this, I said, we need to talk about this. Yish, uh, Messiah says on, or excuse me, Hashem says on six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is a holy day for you, a Shabbat of complete rest to honor, in honor of Adonai, whoever does any work will be put to death. That's a very tough, strong statement right there. A couple of things I want to mention. We talked about the 39 melachot, the 39 um, works, and those works all were connected to work in the temple, the tabernacle. And I can't get into all of them, but I'm going to give you the, um, the six uh, categories. Field work, making material curtains, making leather curtains, making beams of the Mishkan, the putting up and taking down of the Mishkan, the Mishkan's final touches. And in those, we have the 39. Just like in the Ten Commandments, we have the 613 um, instructions within there as well that Yeshua brought back down to two. So this is really important to understand something here. When you get down to verse 3, you are not to kindle a fire in any of the homes on Shabbat. In essence, Yeshua added, or I keep saying Yeshua, but in it, Hashem added um, a 40th one. He added not to kindle fire to this. And that's all that's said about it in Tanakh, really, specifically. There are a few places that different things come up. But this is a problem for most of the body of Messiah to deal with. Because they come here and you know what they say? Well, what is, what, what is work? What characterizes work? And sadly, too many don't want to look back to what the Torah of the Jews. They were instructed to, to determine how do we do this? How is it to be done? They were. So when they say something, do you think it should, we should listen to what they actually had to say? Consider what they had to say? Or should we just make something up, which is done all the time, by the way, to say, oh, it means this, it means that, well, I think it means that, and I think it means that. No. How about we go to what God actually said in the, who he gave the authority to, um, just like he gave them the authority and the tools to build the temple and the things they needed, he gave them, them the authority and the tools to learn to make halakha. How do we walk this out? How do we do it together? And they did through great discussion. So let's, I want to talk about this. It's really good. For those who are sola scriptura folks and who, many who are listening, um, this along with hundreds of other verses will pose a big problem to you telling you. You're going to want to make up stuff. You're going to hear people making up all kinds of stuff. You're going to hear one thing split as we see there's 42,000. I heard it was 36,000 denominations. I've been corrected recently to 42,000. Okay. What do you do with this? What do you do with this? This is a big problem. I want to talk to you about it. So what's the big problem that this poses? Is this the only command of what not to do? Just don't kindle a fire on Shabbat? No. But everything else is fine? Just a free fall. You do whatever you want to do. No standards, no nothing. Or not. Are we going to believe what Hashem said and what He told His those who gave instruction to do or not. Now, I want to mention something to you before I go on any further with this. In this passage here is another problem, 35.2, on six days work is to be done, but on the seventh day is to be holy day for you, a Shabbat of complete rest in honor of Adonai. Whoever does any work on it is to be put to death. Oh my gosh, how come people aren't being killed everywhere? Certainly this law is, is being broken, 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 broken. But 
during the Talmudic period, what did the rabbis have to say? They made the death penalty for breaking some of the uh, commands almost non-existent. I mean, if you were out and out just blasphemous and wouldn't, re- wouldn't make teshuvah, wouldn't repent, that's different. But they made it where it almost didn't happen. So then Yeshua comes along. And this is part of the reason why they went to him and said, Hey, Master, we caught this lady in the very act of adultery. What should we do with her? The law of Moses says we should stone her. But at the same time, the rabbis had already, you know, they had got off of, they weren't just killing everybody all the time like they had been. Very rare. We got to balance these things out. And contrary to popular belief, grace didn't show up in the book of Matthew. Hashem's always been full of grace, full of chesed. Never wanting for someone to pay the ultimate penalty for, never. He made it, he went all, did so many things, made all kinds of ways to help men with his sin. Rabbi Bernstein talks a lot about when, uh, uh, when people sin, it's like God doesn't even notice. But when they do the mitzvot, he notices, he sees. You think about your children, you expect them not to be perfect. But when they do something exceptional and they do something that's pleasing unto you, you really notice it. You see that. And so I want to talk about this. I want to connect this to the Brit HaDeshah. Um, and Concerning the 39 Melachot, we went through them last week. You can go through them on your own. Um, people get this idea of, well, we can't keep them all, so we should just, then why even try? You know, and that's kind of like telling your children, you know, you can't be perfect in school, so just get out. Don't even go. Don't even, don't even try. You would never think to tell them that. Um, well, I have a problem with stealing, so it's okay if I just go kill somebody too. It doesn't matter. Of course, you would never say something like that, would you? But that's the kind of idea that people have mm-hmm. and people say. Mm-hmm. The idea of whether or not we should try to keep God's instructions given to Israel as we're grafted onto Israel, partaking in its blessings, we should also be in agreement as it relates to its observations. In particular, as it relates not to be a stumbling block. Especially the, the loftier. Yeshua talked about those some of the Pharisees, not all of them, some particular ones who would, uh, um, they would, he used the term swallow a camel, swallow a big uh, (laughs) unkosher animal, but yet strain out a gnat out of their soup. So again, the idea is, I mean, if you're going to, there's problems on both sides. But Yeshua was saying, how can you swallow this big old camel, figuratively, and strain out this little gnat? We should try and do them all, but at the same time, we need to recognize that murder is not the same thing as, uh, I don't know, you come up with a, what you would characterize as a smaller, line, or smaller sin. It's in particular as it relates to the penalty for it. So let me read, read something to you here. We should also, instead of focusing on the don't, focus on the do. Judaism is all about the mitzvot, doing the work of God. Do it. When you're doing the work of God, you don't have time to do other things to sin. That's the idea. But we need, there's a term we bring up a lot about heart condition. What's the term? Kavanah. What's, ka- what's your kavanah? What's the condition of your heart? That's the part that Hashem sees. Whether or not you're doing the outward thing, he ultimately sees that. But we need to continue to recognize that God did something very, uh, I don't want to say interesting, very specific, that if it's not seen, it'll, the rest of your spiritual understanding, it'll, you'll be messed up. He gave authority to Israel to make halakha and teach the world. He did. Mm-hmm. 
or the way we should walk things out practically. And once people recognize this and accept this, and in particular believers, Scripture gets a whole lot clearer and easier to understand. Who have the authority? And it's, well, once people recognize they accept this, Scripture gets easier to understand. Once you know who had the authority, who was given the job to be the mouthpiece of God? Aharon, what was he? The mouthpiece of who? Moshe. The Jewish people, who are they? Who are they? Who are they? They're the mouthpiece of Hashem on the earth. Some would say they don't believe that this is still true today. And we talked about earlier this idea of pulling out a splinter in someone's eye, but with this pole in your own. Well, the Jewish people have sinned. So have the Gentiles. But guess who hasn't changed? Hashem. I want to read something to you here. I want to turn me to the book of Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 1, this is Rabbi Shaul. And he asks a very, a very important question here. This passage is often overlooked in the body of Messiah and, and the Christianity side. There's a, it, it's, it brings great challenges and misunderstanding. Then what advantage has the Jew? What is the value of being circumcised? Much in every way. In the first place, the Jews were entrusted with the very words of God. Some of these passages say um, that they have been made the oracle of God or the mouthpiece of God, depending on the translation. If some, verse 3, if some of them were unfaithful, so what? And I'm reading from the complete Jewish Bible. Does their faithfulness cancel God's faithfulness? No, not at all. Heaven forbid, or halayla, I believe it is in Hebrew, God would be true even if everyone was a liar. As the Tanakh says, so that you, God, may be proved right in your words and win the verdict when you are put on trial. Very Jewish thing to say. We're going to talk about uh, in a couple weeks, possibly the day if I can move fast enough, we're going to talk about the Zagot and who these men were. And how, do we ha- how does modern Western civilization even function from a legal standpoint based on the laws and the instruction given through the, the Zagot, through the pairs through that, that, that dealt with case law? And we're going to talk more about that. But when you see this idea of trial or this idea of proved right, or this idea of someone, of a debate going on, extremely Jewish, extremely Jewish. Verse 5, now if your unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, what should we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict his anger on us? And he has in parentheses, I am speaking here the way the people commonly do. Again, heaven forbid Else, how could God judge the world? But you say, if through my lie, God's truth is enhanced and brings him greater glory, why am I still judged merely for being a sinner? Indeed, why not say, as some people slander us by proclaiming we do, let us do evil so that good may come of it. Against them, the judgment is a just one. Even right here, when Rav Shaul wrote this, there's already slanderous people slandering Judaism. He's just a Jew who has found Messiah. But there's people who are slandering that already. Who do you think slandering that? Other Jews? No. Other Jews, they know, under the same thing, they're not saying 
let's go and do evil because so Hashem's, you know, his forgiveness will be made more wonderful. This is from the outside. These are Gentiles doing this. Accusation, accusation against the house of Israel. Romans 3, 9, the heading here is no one is righteous. So are we Jews better off? Not entirely. For I have already made the charge that all people, Jews and Gentiles alike, are controlled by sin. All in the same big sin boat. That some like to point out other sins and forget about their own. As the Tanakh puts it, there is no one righteous, not even one. No one understands, no one seeks God. All, someone say all, have turned away at the same time, become useless. There is no one who shows kindness, no, not a single one. Verse 13, their throats are open graves. They use their tongues to deceive Vipers, venom is under their lips. Their mouths are full of curses and bitterness. Their feet rush to shed blood, and their ways are ruined in misery. And the way of shalom, they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We talked about earlier the fear of God brings what? Wisdom. So you see this connection between fearing God and being wise. You can't separate them. Moreover, we know that whatever the Torah says, this is Paul talking about Torah. It says in King James and different versions that are in many's estimation intentionally made to be anti-Jewish. Moreover, we know that whatever the Torah says, it says to those living within the framework of Torah, in order that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world judged, the whole world be shown to deserve God's adverse judgment. For in his sight, no one alive will be considered righteous on the ground of legalistic observance of Torah commands because of what really, because what Torah really does is show people how sinful they are. This verse is taken out of context terribly to the detriment of people who are hearing it, who are being taught. For in his sight, no one alive will be considered righteous on the ground of legalistic observance of Torah. That's true. Does that say, so we should just forget all about it and do whatever? No. But that's what it's taken to be said. Oh, we don't need that Torah stuff anymore. Rabbi Shapiro was talking about, I'm going to take a quick little rabbit trail. The rabbis have talked about three great wars. Thank you. Three great wars amongst the Gentiles. Christians killing Christians in three great wars. We've already seen two of them. We're in the beginnings of the third one. And Torah shows people how sinful they are. It's an amazing thing that no one will be considered righteous on the ground of legalistic observance. No, we don't teach that. We teach it through the, through the blood of Messiah. Um, but we don't just get rid of it. This is what I'm getting at. And I, I mentioned something a minute ago, and I'm trying to remember. I've got a little sidetracked here. I, I'll remember the thought I was gonna, what I was going to say. Verse 21 says, but now, quite apart from Torah, God's way of making people righteous in his sight has been made clear, although the Torah and the prophets give their witness to it as well. And it is a righteousness that comes from God through faithfulness in Yeshua, the Messiah, to all who continue trusting. For it makes no difference whether one is a Jew or a Gentile, since all have sinned and come short of the, earning the God's praise. Another scripture taken out of context. Oh, it doesn't make any difference if you're a Jew or a Gentile. No, it absolutely does. Totally different calling. Totally different expectation. We work together, absolutely, through Messiah. In Messiah, we're all the same. But in service and in, in, um, uh, in um, calling and expectation, 
God has not removed his, his, um, his job description from Israel, from the Jewish people. Regardless how good they are, regardless how bad they are, as people would think or say, God has not removed it. We're seeing a lot of stuff happening in our world right now. Um, and with all the stuff going on, I want you to look at something. Look, what, look, look what's going on in Israel right now. You know, we've got friends there who were leaving. We had one friend leaving to Morocco. It's terrible. They're on the verge of civil war. Scripture tells us that when the Jewish people come to recognize Messiah, that's like life from the dead for everyone else too. We need to continue to pray for Israel that they would practice Torah. We have a lot of, um, within Ahavad Ami, Rabbi does a lot of work with the Orthodox in Israel. Um, he does a lot of work with um, the Lemba in Africa, all these different, with, you know, anyone who has a connection to Judaism, he's willing to work with and help. Paul's saying right here, apart from Torah, apart from Torah, apart from Torah, God's way of making people righteous in his sight has been made clear. If you don't know Torah, you don't know even how to be righteous in his sight. If you reject Torah, then you're rejecting the ability to know how to be righteous in his sight. Verse 24, by God's grace, without earning it, all are granted the status of being considered righteous before him, though the act redeeming us from our enslavement to sin was accomplished by the Messiah, Yeshua. God put Yeshua forward as a kapara, kapara for sin through his faithfulness in respect to his bloody sacrificial death. This vindicated God's righteousness because in his forbearance, he had passed over with neither punishment nor remission the sins people had committed in the past. And it vindicates his righteousness in the present age by showing that he is righteous himself and is also the one who makes people righteous on the ground of Yeshua's faithfulness by the merit of Yeshua, we are made righteous. Another Jewish understanding, too, that's not something that just came on the scene that someone said in the name of or by the merit of. It existed in Judaism. We've talked about the idea of cleaving to a tzaddik. That whole idea that's been around for long before Messiah came. Messiah just uh, continued it. Now we pray things in his merit. Verse 27 here, so what room is left for boasting? None at all. What kind of Torah excludes it? One that has to do with legalistic observance of rules. Or actually, it's a question. One that has to do with legalistic observance of rules? No. Rather, a Torah that has to do with trusting. This is where we always get to. Yeshua talked about legalistic observance. We'll get into some of this later on, but we're all familiar with, with Hillel and Shammai. The two houses, the one that was more lenient and the one that was more legalistic about certain things. Like 99% of the time, Yeshua sided with Hillel. And on one occasion, he sided with, uh, with the house of Shammai. Regarding divorce, he basically said, you know, in effect, you can't just leave your wife for just anything, you know. You've got to have some grounds to do it. And he sided with Shammai. But again, it's back to the same thing. Who had the authority to make halakha or to make legally binding ways of doing things? House of Israel. Verse 27, so what room is left for boasting? None at all. What kind of Torah excludes it? One that has to do with legalistic observance of rules. This is why we don't teach legalistic observance of rules. Yeshua didn't either. What did he say? He talked about the letter of the law, spirit of the law. 
you know, if we go back to legalistic rules, a lot more people would have died with Moshe than did. A whole lot more. The sons of Korah that died, there's something interesting that I'll teach on when we get to that portion here in the coming months. Verse 28, therefore we hold the view that a person comes to be considered righteous by God on the ground of trusting, which has nothing to do with legalistic observance of Torah commands, but it also has nothing to do with just getting rid of all Torah commands either, forsaking the ways of your father. People leave stuff out. They want to get one thing and just run with it and not look at the whole thing. Judaism is always about looking at both sides. And you may not agree, but you understand where both sides are coming from. You understand both sides of the case. A judge, when he sits on, uh, on a trial, he understands both sides of the case. We're called to judge. How? How can you judge if you don't understand both sides of a case? How can you be a righteous judge? can't be. No matter how much you squash it with a spatula, every pancake always has two sides. Can't separate them. Two sides. Therefore, we hold the view that a person comes to be considered righteous by God on the ground of trusting, which has nothing to do with legalistic observance of Torah commands, Or is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he the God of the Gentiles? Yes, he is indeed the God of the Gentiles. All throughout the Talmud and the writings of the rabbis, they talk about this idea of one day, around the time Mashiach comes back, that the Gentiles will be coming in. That this understand there is a necessity for them, for the Jewish people to rectify. And, um, and introduce, if you will, in some ways, the Gentiles to the Father. That, that's their job, to bring it to Kun. Yes, he is indeed the God of the Gentiles, because, as you will admit, God is one, Echad. Therefore, he will consider righteous the circumcised on the ground of trusting and the uncircumcised through that same trusting. Does it follow that we abolish Torah by this trusting? Heaven forbid. Those of you who are watching who would say things like, Paul taught a different doctrine than Jesus, you're you're flat out deceived. You're teaching people error. You're teaching people to turn away from the instruction of God. You can't just skip over passages like this and cherry pick things that make Paul seem like he's an anti-Semite, which he absolutely wasn't. Quit doing that kind of stuff. There are, there's great wars coming in Christians fighting Christians. This last great war we've already started, you turn on your news and look at what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. Christians fighting Christians. And it's going to get worse. This is an end times prophecy coming to pass that the rabbis have been talking about for thousands of years. And it's right here. Yeshua said, he talked about this idea of what would happen to those who tell people to stop practicing my law and teach them to break my law. There's a battle of Armageddon that comes up. The last great battle. Christians killing Christians. That's a sad thing. Or, well, Christians killing Christians leads up to that. Messiah summoning them and and wiping them out based on what the rabbis teach all over how the nations have treated the Jewish people for thousands of years. You think you can just get away with it and have no recompense from the Holocaust, 
which was the absolute worst. Christians killing Jews. And Christians standing by and, you know, when the train passes by, just sing a little louder, sing a little louder. We don't want to go. There's a payday coming for that stuff to the nations. And we're seeing it. Nobody wants to talk about it, but we're seeing it. And I'm telling people who are watching, watch out. Make sure you're on the right side of this. You know Messiah. That's a wonderful thing. You better make sure you're grafting into the house of Israel too and clinging on to Israel, the house of Israel. And there's a lot of Jewish brothers out there and sisters who have left the house of Israel too. You need to cling back and go back to practicing Torah. Go to your synagogue. There's a lot of things going on right now. Rabbi Shapira, you know, when this whole war broke out in Ukraine, he said, you know, that's the first Torah he ever delivered was to Kiev. Mm -hmm. You know, we know a lot of uh, rabbis in Crimea that we were with an organization with for some time mm -hmm. before they were invaded and all of that going. Why am I saying all this? Rabbi Shaul, what was he doing? He was sent to the nations to bring them into the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. He didn't just say, okay, don't strangle things. Don't fornicate with the temple prostitutes and don't um, eat things sacrificed to idols, thanks. He said to them, what else did he do? What else happened? On Shabbat, where were they? They were with the Jews practicing Judaism through Messiah. And they would go into the synagogue knowing absolutely zip. And they would have to learn and catch up. There was no we're going to have this class for those of you who just came Shabbat Shalom. Those of you who just came to know Judaism, no, they were, you talk about throwing a baby bird out of the nest and say, fly, fly, fly. It was more along that line. But they were brought in to learn Judaism through Messiah in light of Messiah, Messianic Judaism. Let me read this one more time. We're going to end here. Does it follow that we abolish Torah by this trusting God? We trust God, we can get rid of Torah. No, you trust God because you have Torah, because he's told you who Messiah is, because he's told you what to do. He's given you instructions on how to live. Does it follow that we abolish Torah by this trusting? Heaven forbid, on the contrary, we confirm Torah. Anybody out there who tells you Paul said something different, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're talking about. Don't separate Judaism from Paul. Don't separate it from the Brit the New Testament. Don't separate it from Messiah. Mm -hmm. Or else you'll be teaching a totally different religion that is man-made, that has nothing to do with the family of God. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time we've had together to study your word. And as we continue to move forward in our service, we thank you for continuing to help us, continue to receive from us as we do the best we can, O oh God, to serve you with what we know. We thank you and praise you for this in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen.